We now have a session focusing on the relationship between AI, science, and society. And once again, we have an extraordinary group of people we're bringing together. European Commission Vice President for Values and Transparency, Vera Jourova. The co-founder and CEO of Google DeepMind, Demis Hassabis. And two Nobel laureates in science, Paul Nurse, who's the 2001 Nobel laureate in medicine, and Ben Feringa, 2016 Nobel laureate in chemistry. Those four will be moderated by, as Mo said, Maria Leptin. Please welcome them. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. We have a panel of four people here who've just been introduced and who might, you might feel will be hard to mesh in their interests and in their outlooks. But um, they're all very broad-minded and interesting. And what I would like to do first is to ask the three scientists, Demis, Paul, and Ben, to talk about how AI and re impacts on their own research. I'm sure this will be of interest to many in the audience to figure out what real actual scientists actually do with AI in their research. And then I would like uh, Vice President Yorova to say how AI impacts her work, which is a very different ballpark. And then in the second round, we'll see how these two uh, fields um, influence each other, help each other, what they do democracy for democracy and society. So Demis, would you like to start talking about your own work? Sure. Um, so I spent my whole life working on AI because I've always regarded it as potentially the ultimate tool for helping us to do science and accelerate scientific discovery. Um, if you think about AI at sort of an abstract level, it's, it's, a, it's a system or a tool that can make sense of a lot of data, find patterns in a lot of data, find insights and structure in, in data. And a lot of what we do in science is, uh, starts with that, um, and then you can build insights on top of that. And so um, for many, many years, AI has been developing. Of course, we're now at this incredible inflection point. And I think we're about to enter maybe the next 10 years, maybe a new golden era of scientific discovery um, helped by AI in many, many fields. So at DeepMind, um, mm -hmm. we've done a lot of work in biology, especially. Uh, so um, probably most well known is our program AlphaFold that um, uh, pretty much solved the problem of protein folding. So trying to find the 3D structure of proteins uh, just from its amino acid sequence, its genetic sequence. Uh, and that has all sorts of implications in drug discovery and disease understanding. And um, we, over the, over the last couple of years, we've uh, found the structures and, and predicted the structures of over 200 million proteins, pretty much every protein known to science, which um, you know, would have taken many, many, actually uh, millions of years of experimental work of time to do uh, uh, that, that number of proteins. So I think we're just sort of seeing a revolution in biology. I think it's gonna apply to other areas too, like chemistry, material science, physics, and, and mathematics. Um, I think all of these areas, scientific di disciplines, will, be, will benefit from AI. Right, we'll hear your thoughts about the risks and op opportunities later. Paul, as a biologist. Without any question, um, the biggest impact has been Demis Hassabis's um, AlphaFold. Um, I, my lab has only worked in this area um, for a, a year or two, and we use AlphaFold all the time. It's amazing, it allows you to predict, as you said, the three-dimensional structure of proteins based on DNA structure. And why that's so important is people like us in my lab, amateurs, can actually use this information to turn sequences into biochemistry. It isn't always right, but it is sufficiently right to be a fantastic tool. So that's the, that's the main thing that's helped us. We use it in little ways. We can analyze images to uh, predict um, uh, how, they, um, how we can analyze data in the future. That's simple stuff by Demis's standards, but it's very uh, useful for us. ChatGPT, pretty hopeless for us, actually. 
<laughs> if I may say. You know, what we get back is something like a middle quality high student's assessment of the area. Sorry about that, but that's what I think about it. But maybe it will get better. Maybe it will get better. And um, something that Demis said, um, which, which I just want to amplify on, what AI does is allows you to predict things. It doesn't necessarily allow you to actually understand things. But it is the first step in understanding. So it's very, very important, but we have to take it further. Super. Ben, as a chemist. Yes, I, I'm a chemist, and in the laboratory, you know, we design molecules and materials. Let me give you an example where we use AI. If you want to make a new pharmaceutical, a new drug to treat cancer, for instance, you need sometimes 35, 40 different chemical conversions, chemical steps to build, <coughs> how, to build like Lego, to build a molecule, a complex molecule that treats best breast cancer, for instance. And to design these routes, there are hundreds or maybe thousands of possibilities, you know. So from all the collective information that we have in the chemical literature, yeah, and in the physical literature, we then use these programs to design routes. And then, of course, there's still the human factor to decide, are there new, better routes, you know, that are more easy to make at less steps, yeah? And uh, can we make a drug uh, easier, yeah, exactly? needed for that specific target, you know? And that helps us a lot. Let me give you another example. Hair shampoo. <laughs> yeah, you are laughing. <laughs> but that is, <laughs> look, look at my colleague here, you know? <laughs> that is a complex chemical Demis problem. Won't be interested that is at a all. complex. <laughs> uh, I, did, I did say that. <laughs> that is a complex chemical and physical problem. You might not realize that. There are many, many parameters that make it a hair shampoo and many different components. And to make that kind of shampoo, you know, when you talk with the big industry and so, it's a real difficult problem to make a good hair shampoo. Now, you can get all these data and train your computer what combinations you need. And then <coughs> what we do is, then we train our, our robots, so we are now building robot systems in the lab, we feed this data to the robots. They do then selected experiments, so we don't have to do 1,000 experiments, but maybe only 100, and to get the right combination, you know, and to get the information that we need to make a good hair shampoo for you. <laughs> you'd, you'd never have thought that. Vice President Jurova. Can you, can you repeat the question, please? And good evening, by the way. <laughs> What, what does AI do for you in your work? Transparency, values, ah. that's your portfolio. These are actually topics that we've talked about in other sessions today yeah. about AI, but this is your portfolio. What does AI do for you? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, maybe one, one comment on what it means for me in private life. I ask my adult children whether they are ready for taking care of me and they told me that they will buy Avatar to do it. And I, I was a bit scared by that, and then it reflected in my job, because indeed, uh, my, my job is uh, values, transparency, it sounds abstract, but my job, in fact, is that all the achievements, all the human rights, equality, respect for human dignity, decency, that all that is projected into this new parallel world, in fact. And it was uh, something I tried to do uh, in case of the digital platforms. That I, I was really working with the, with the big, big platforms over years to convince them that there should be no space for crime and there should be no space for algorithms which just put the people into cages or bubbles, if you like. And it's similar with, with AI, because uh, the technology is uh, now um, having a very, very uh, quick start. We started to legislate uh, as the commission, it is the, the body which proposes uh, legislation. We started to, uh, to do something about it in 2018. We started with ethics standards. So some, something which was not legally binding, but rather some, some moral call. 
And then we proposed the first uh, AI law for the whole EU in 2021. But in the meantime, ChatGPT came. <laughs> and, and suddenly I saw how, how much true is that when, when I say that money and technology is always quicker than the law, <laughs> we saw the speed of light. Suddenly, ChatGPT invaded our lives. And so we had to reflect on it in, the, in that first law, which was still in the making. You know, we are sometimes very slow, but well. The what about and Paul's comment on what ChatGPT does for mm. him in the lab, namely, just sort of so-so stuff. Do you see the same, or is it actually valuable? For I think it will get better, as, as Paul indicated, yeah? Because it's learning. It's, yeah. it's, it's uh, fascinating. It's learning. It might be a very, very useful tool. Uh, also, we discuss with the journalists, with the media, whether AI and especially ChatGPT will destroy their work <laughs> because uh, they uh, feel that their work has been stolen by AI. Yeah? And uh, so we also have to uh, take proper position on, on these new technological possibilities. But ChatGPT will definitely improve. And, and uh, what, what you said, Mr. Professor, not about the shampoo, I have to think about it, <laughs> but uh, you, you, you mentioned collective information. Yeah. I would really like ChatGPT to contain collective wisdom. Yeah? And it's a little bit a different story. Yes, wisdom, of course. Okay. Um, ben, no, do you want to, do you want to respond directly? We, we put in data that are based on sound scientific experiments. And ChatGPT, in the science at least, it's all based on the quality of data. So the American colleagues say, rubbish in, rubbish out. <laughs> so if you put in good data, Chat GPT yeah. will use it. I don't know, the colleagues here can comment on it. It all depends upon how you train them, what quality of data you put in there. And then you can get a lot out. But indeed, also with the students, Paul was mentioning this, I see sometimes reports of my students the Dutch students, the Belgian students in my group are the Chinese students, and they use Oxford English words that I have never even seen. <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> now then you know there is something wrong, you know, they just picked it from the chat TV. <laughs> Okay, but, you've, but already, you've already learned the tricks for I detecting. I learned the tricks Very to some good. extent, yes. We don't even not, need AI <laughs> to detect but he can AI. On this. Paul, I can not see Not everything then in Oxford is right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. All right, all right. I want chat GPT <laughs> with spark, with spark. You understand? Yeah. Something a bit more lively, something a little bit more imaginative. And Demis but is going to tell us how we can do that. Well, Demis, yeah. actually, um, <laughs> I mean, you know the risks, yes. and as, as Ben was saying, perhaps in our research where the training was on good, you know, verified data, they're, 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 they're less than um, in, in politics. But tell us a yeah. little bit so about... Maybe I can pick up yeah, on a few please. themes that have been mentioned by the other panelists. So, first of all, uh, I think it's important to realize AI is much more than just the chatbots. Yes. So even though chatbots is what everyone's sort of gone crazy over, and maybe it's the way that the general public uh, interacts with AI in, in a most visceral way, but there are, I think a lot of the most interesting AI systems are actually different types of systems specialized for these scientific endeavors, um, things like AlphaFold. I think we're going to see a lot more of those types of systems. Just on the chatbots themselves, of course, we, we're all working on those systems as well. Uh, our, our particular one's called Gemini. And we, this is a really important problem that Ben brought up that we have to fix if we want to ever use these chatbots for something more than, you know, your school homework. Is it's got to, um, we got to solve the factuality problem. And that's a core problem we have to solve with these AI systems in general is to yeah. make sure they don't hallucinate uh, and they stick to facts. And, and then I think they would be quite useful as a sort of maybe like a research assistant level mm. um, in terms of summarizing an area or mm. some, a, a series of papers. And then the senior scientists and the scientists can then start making, it helps them make connections, maybe especially things like interdisciplinary science would become easier sure. then, I think. So I think that's coming. Uh, it's not an easy problem, but maybe um, using it for science can help drive the research in these, in these technologies in the right direction. 
So actually, we're working on a, a science large language model that could be like a research assistant uh, and maybe help you predict um, things like the outcome of an experiment. You could imagine describing an experiment, and then maybe it gives you some view on that. So these sorts of things are coming maybe in the next few years. Yes. Um, I think just to, just to touch on another thing as well is one of the things I think AI is generally useful for, if you abstract away from AlphaFold or the systems that we have, what they're really doing is, even the shampoo example you gave, is <laughs> that you've got this huge combinatorial space of possibilities. Could be in chemistry, could be in, math, in, in mathematics, in physics, in biology. And you're trying to search, like needle in a haystack, understand that space, uh, whether it's chemistry or biology, understand the structure of that space, and then search in it to find the solution or a solution ac according to an objective function you have and try and output that solution. That's what really what a, a lot of science boils down to. And any of those, um, any, if you can couch your problem in that way, then these types of AI systems that we're building now ca we can be very useful for it. Yes. So, um, yeah, I think, I think there's huge potential yes. there. Thank you. So I want to get to another point. We've been in a number of other sessions today, and the, uh, the, the risks were discussed, algorithms that are based on getting clicks through fear, hate, anger. Um, you, you have to, and, and the mistrust in what comes out of anything AI, the large language models, the foundational models. Um, Ben, how do you how do you how do you get your students to recognize whether what they spit out for your molecules that you want to test? How do you uh, what well, do they just run off and say this model says we should test yeah, this no, compound? This is a really important issue, of course, because you have to be careful. I'm very positive about the opportunities of AI and all these technologies, but a critical attitude is really crucial. So how do we train the people, you know, to use this information, this data? And especially we are at the university scientists. We have to, the first and primary <coughs> important thing is to train our students, our young people, to be critical, to think about what does it mean, yeah? What, on what data sets is this information, what is this analysis based? And then what is the output, you know, ask critical questions. And I think this is crucial in the whole education process, you know, to use these new technologies, etc. So once again, we should not be too afraid, but of course there is the danger yeah, of all kinds of misinformation that you get, etc. It's even worse, I think, when you go to journalism and all this influencing the public opinion. But okay, I'm a scientist. There, even there, we have to be very critical. Yeah? What is the quality of, what does it tell you, you know, and on what data is it based? Yeah? Mm. Yes. So is that useful for you, this idea that we have to, I mean, for Vera, that, uh, again, values and transparency, that we need people to understand the limitations and ask critical questions? Of course. Is, so. yes. is that important for democracy? I mean, nobody's going to say no, but... How many hours do we have to <laughs> speak about what are all the things which are endangering democracy now? Uh, by the way, it was a very interesting debate before here, so congratulations. You, you, there were some very, very interesting ideas which I want to steal already tomorrow in my tomorrow speech. But, uh, but um, what I wanted to say for me is important to protect the autonomous critical thinking of each individual. Yes. Because what we witness in this digital era that more and more there is a tendency to create a crowd and individual people are disappearing. Sorry, I am a philosopher and lawyer, so I sometimes am not, not, e I'm not easy to understand, but we already saw it when uh, we started to work on the data privacy uh, protection. That I, I, I wanted each individual to be the master of his or her identity. And now it's, it's similar with AI. When I work, I think about the person, the voter, the citizen, not a consumer, citizen, yes. who should still be able to recognize what is false and what is true. Because isn't in democracy and in democratic elections important that I, as a voter, understand that this is a real per person speaking to me? 
he or she wants to be elected. He or she is promising me something and that I don't see AI production. So in other words, in our rules, which we are now testing in the EU, we have the rule that the AI text or produced text or image or, or some, some video, once it is, it is uh, truly pr produced by AI, is labeled mm. that yes. I, as the citizen, see this is the production of AI. And I think that this is, this is important also before elections, maybe 10 days elections, we will see that even the platforms will be proactively and systematically remove deep fakes. Because this is what yes. Uh, yes. was we said heard here. Maria Ressa talk about this that information on, today. on steroids. Yes. This yes. is exactly the situation. So now we, we have the commitment of all the big technological companies, except Twitter, now, now X, they don't they are not friends with us, <laughs> but uh, we, we have the commitment that they will either label this production or remove it so that the people can be sure that what they read, they, they know what they read and what they want to take as an inspiration for the, for the elections. Yes. Without that, we will only see hidden manipulation. Mm. So then we can just forget about free and fair elections. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I'm glad I don't hear fear and anger there, but a rational approach. But I, Paul is forever an optimist. Yes, I, wa I wanted to. Say, I think we got a real opportunity here because, um, in the past, if you wanted to look at a, a topic, you would go to the library, you would trawl through the journals, you would uh, take days, maybe weeks, to put things together, that these sorts of methods can produce in minutes. Now, frankly, that was rather dull, so reducing it to minutes is a good thing. But the second point I want to make, close to what Ben was saying, is that the next thing that's required is critical thinking. And we give time for the students and time for the researchers for critical thought. So the time we liberate from trawling through the library is then applied to critical thinking. That has educational consequences. We need to teach our students critical thinking. Is, maybe but, even our kindergarten children already. Yeah. But we also need, and this is just again to emphasize what you've heard, is the providence of the data that is used to generate this, this analysis has got to be good. And when Demis says you can do it in science, I, I enc I'm encouraged by that, of course, because science on the whole is going to be more reliable. So I think there's a real opportunity there. The providence of the data matters. The second is the performance of the algorithms that are actually analyzing it. We have to really understand that so that we can ensure that they're going to work in the ways that we want. And the third thing is understanding what's going on. We can't just be stupid and just press the button on the computer. We have to understand what's going on. Yes. Demis, do you want to comment on whether that's actually even possible for anyone other than you? Yeah. And what, <laughs> what can you actually do and recommend to, to help people see these things critically? I totally agree with what Paul and Ben said about um, critical thinking and actually hypothesis generation. These are all what the human scientists need to bring to the table and understanding. And then it's complementary to what I think these tools can do, which is a lot of the data gathering and, and, and sort of data analysis. So I, I totally 100% agree on that. Um, I think uh, in terms of like uh, AI and democracy and, and, and what Vera was talking about, again, I think we can use AI as part of a solution if we're clever. So things like watermarking in a way, where, you know, we work on this thing called SynthID, which uses AI to invisibly and imperceptibly watermark 
these images, these generated images, so that government and others and journalists can detect it and then it can be flagged automatically. And it's hard to remove by a hacker or a, or a, a bad actor. Yeah. You know, so, and we can think of AI and defensive posture also maybe in cybersecurity, things like this. I think AI is going to be a very important tool for our democracies to defend themselves. Um, so I think there's that. I think also we've talked quite a lot about the risks, uh, uh, you know, but I think we should also think about the opportunities. I feel like democracies, you know, one of our strengths is um, our freedom to innovate and create you know, uh, in, in incredible things. And that's what we do with our sciences. And I think AI can accelerate that and can be, if we use it in the responsible way, I think it can help us with many of the challenges we're seeing facing society today, like our healthcare systems, making them more efficient, helping with climate change, new technologies, fusion and other things where AI can be applied to, to help <coughs> accelerate. Uh, and that will give us the prosperity in our democracies to then um, and strengthen and make them more resilient. Yeah. So I do think AI, is a, if we grasp that opportunity in the right way and we use it in the right way, could be an incredible strength for democracies to accelerate what we already do best, uh, which is innovate and do science and discover new knowledge, okay. including things like truth. Ben, you, uh, uh, yes, Vera, you'll get, you'll actually get the last word. Um, <coughs> you, you speak to children in schools. Do you see hope there or do you yes. see doom? No, no. Because I, doom I, is what we usually hear, I the am, young people, etc. Thank you for the question. Yes, I go to schools, elementary schools, high schools, and of course I teach students. Actually, and he also spends a lot of the income that he gets from shampoo making to support this. <laughs> so. It's really admirable. When you, go, when you go to elementary schools and you discuss with the kids, you know, the excitement, the creativity, you know, the eagerness to learn, it's, it's, it's absolutely overwhelming. But yes, it is there where we should start at early age, you know, to train our kids, our teachers, the students, everyone, as Paul said, asking questions. Science is all about questions. Knowledge is about asking questions, asking questions to your teacher, asking questions to society, to mother nature, etc., and to have a critical attitude and to enable them to distinguish what is valuable information. This is not always easy, you know, with all the information. We get a tsunami of information from internet. Mm -hmm. And I want to make a quote from the book of Harari, if you allow me. You know Noah Harari who wrote about Homo Deus, the future of mankind? There's a beautiful quote. In the past, the power, this is also important for politicians, by the way. <laughs> In the past, the power was with those who knew the information, who had access to information. In the future, the power will be with those that know what they can neglect from all this flood of information and what is really valuable. Yes. Very good, thank you. Vera. I'm not even going to ask you a question. I see you frantically taking notes, so comments, please. Okay, no. thank you very much. There is one more interesting quote of Harari, by the way. How, how to quote it, so to be precise, that we are already creating a, a artificial intelligence without having beaten natural stupidity. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that was not in my comment. And I, I was so sorry to read it because it was exactly my idea when I was standing in London uh, in front of uh, Winston Churchill statue one day before the conference in Langley when we discussed also with China, by the way, and, and with the global leaders about the secure AI. I was thinking about this is exactly what Churchill would say <laughs> about the, uh, the, the, uh, the natural stupidity of, of human beings. But uh, uh, I... You inspired me, me for, for a few comments. I think the task of today for the politicians, for the technologists, but also for the researchers is to join forces and to make sure that AI will simply be useful for the people. It's such a simple task and it will yes. be difficult to do it. Uh, but I think that we are in the, in the right moment to uh, create some kind of permanent uh, common work. And this is exactly what we are proposing uh, when it comes to big models, uh, the, the generative AI. Because uh, what ha was happening up to now, it was the, some kind of dialogue between the world of technologies and technologists, big companies making big money on, on this, and politicians. 
the politicians complain that they, they, the others, the, the business side, wants to make more and more money without being responsible. And the technologists say that uh, politicians are more and more ignorant. I will not repeat the words, <laughs> today, <laughs> but, but that we, we don't understand. That's why it's so important that now we want to create some kind of triangle. Uh, technologists, politics or public sphere and research. And the role of the research will be to test early on the new models Thank to you. be able to predict the consequences. Because all that is about prediction of consequences of something, we still don't know what it is. Very good. Yeah. I'm actually, as the head of a research funding organization for fundamental blue sky research, I'm very happy to have you end on this note. Any more comments on fundamental blue sky research from this panel for Demis, you want well, to say? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, I think it's absolutely key, and that's what all these new, you know, we see now um, the flourishing of more like 20 years of basic research oh, far you know, more. of in AI, yes. at least, which has led to the modern machine learning boom. 10 years of that in, in, in academia before it became into mm -hmm. what we exactly. see today in industry, and I think that's the common path. Yes. It's critical. Yes. So, Wonderful. I'm sure we can, we, can, we can actually go out and go on and continue this discussion. Sadly, without you, but I hope you got some ideas, some inspiration. And I want to thank our wonderful panel here. Thank you.